Hello guys and welcome back. If you have not seen part one of the rise and fall of Playboy, go watch that first. But if you've seen it, then let's get straight into this video. So now we're heading into the latter part of the 1970s and I want to share the following story with you. Not because it has any real relevance to Playboy, but simply because I found it an interesting piece of pop culture trivia and hopefully you will too. So we all know the famous Hollywood sign that stands tall in the Beachwood Canyon community of Los Angeles. It's considered somewhat the international symbol for fame and fortune. Well, the sign was originally erected in 1923, not as a tourist landmark, but as a temporary advertisement for a housing development in the Hollywood Hills and originally read as Hollywood Land. It used to have thousands of light bulbs lighting up the letters, flashing in segments, Hollywood land and a searchlight below that drew more attention to the advert. And as someone obsessed with old Hollywood, what I would not give to have seen the original Hollywood land sign lit up. But being only an advert, the sign was only designed to last roughly 18 months. But with the rise of cinema and Hollywood, the sign soon became an icon and remained standing for another 50 years, although the word land was removed in 1949. As you can imagine, by the 70s, the sign was falling to Pieces. So in 1978, Hugh Hefner fronted a campaign to restore the sign. Nine people ended up donating just over $27,500 for each letter of the sign. The Y, by the way, belongs to Hef, if you were curious. Two years later, Hef received his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, no doubt in part for saving the iconic Los Angeles landmark. And if you can't tell, I have a serious personal interest in the history of the sign or honestly anything LA and Hollywood related. LA is literally like my favorite place. If you are a Los Angelino, let me know down below. Say hello. <laughs> Anyway, I rambled a lot about irrelevant information. Uh, do let me know down below if you would be interested in a video maybe outlining a history of the Hollywood sign or possibly a video on Peg and Twistle, the actress that took her own life by jumping off the sign in 1932. Uh, I think it could make for a very interesting video, but you guys let me know regardless. Here we are. We have finally reached the 1980s and it's an era that would change Hugh Hefner's life forever. In 1985, Hef suffered a stroke, which forced him to reassess his life and daily habits. Following his recovery, Hef quit smoking, began eating a healthy diet. Speaking of eating, my cat is now eating in the background. So if you can hear little crunching sounds, it's just my cat. She'll be done in a few minutes. <laughs> Sorry. And he started working out, although Hef did continue to enjoy his favorite drink on the regular, good old Jack Daniels. <laughs> In 1982, Hef made his daughter, Christine, the president of Playboy Enterprises, potentially to take some of the stress off of himself. Five years later, Christine became the CEO and would remain as such for the next 21 years. Throughout the decade, sales of Playboy magazine would steadily decline from a circulation of 5.3 million on average in 1980, dropping down to 4.1 by the mid 80s and 3.5 by the start of the 90s. By the latter part of the decade, Hef had met his his second wife, January 1988 Playmate of the Month and Playmate of the Year, 
Kimberly Conrad. The couple wed in 1989 when Hef was 63 and Kimberly was 27. It had also been a massive half century, 50 years, since Hugh Hefner's first marriage to Millie back in 1949. At least nobody can say that Hugh Hefner rushed into his second marriage, I guess. At the time, people were shocked that the playboy himself, Hugh Hefner, had finally decided to settle down. Many unaware, of course, that this was his second marriage. Hef later did admit that the stroke did give him a rather big health scare, making him feel his age for maybe the first time ever, which is why he decided to settle down and give the whole kids and wife thing a go again. The following year, Kimberly gave birth to their first child together, a boy named Marston, who was also born on Hef's birthday, April 9. And then in 1991, they had another boy named Cooper. Side note, imagine your step siblings being born in 1952 and 1955, and you're born in 1989 and 1990. Totally crazy. It's literally like me having a step sibling that is about 70 years old. I mean, my parents are younger than that. I mean, look, no judgment, but oof, that is, that's, that's pretty wild. I, I don't know, that's crazy. <laughs> After the birth of his two sons, Hef transformed the Playboy Mansion into a somewhat family-friendly sanctuary, although he still did host the odd wild party or two after the boys' bedtimes. Cooper Hefner would later go on to describe his childhood as really normal, aside from the fact his school literally went on a field trip to his own house to see the zoo, something Cooper did admit to not knowing was out of the ordinary at the time. Hef and Kimberly's marriage would last for nine years, although the couple didn't actually divorce until 2009, after both boys turned 18, meaning Hef was still legally married during the filming of The Girls Next Door. Hef would later say in regards to the marriage, quote, I was faithful, she was not. The pair remained amicable for at least a little while, with Hef buying the home next door to the mansion for Kimberly and the boys to live, and I suppose to keep some level of normality in the boys' lives. The home next door was actually a mirror image of the Playboy Mansion, but smaller, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> the peace between the pair didn't last long though, and they began fighting over what else? Money. <sighs> okay, so let's jump into my childhood decade, the 1990s. This decade really saw an evident decline in the Playboy empire, with both the magazine and the brand failing to keep up. After all, the 90s was the rise of the World Wide Web. Perhaps the magazine's true killer. After all, why would you pay to see nudes when it was so darn easy to look them up? I mean, back in the 90s, it did take about an hour for an image to load. That is if the home phone was free and you could use the dial-up internet. And this, of course, all depended on if your household actually was lucky enough to own a personal home computer. It really was tough growing up in the 1990s. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Unfortunately for Playboy, they didn't exactly jump on the old internet trend bandwagon as fast as they should have, and certainly not as fast as some of their counterparts. Apparently in the early days when people were looking up Playboy on the internet, their competitors were coming up. So that's not good. I get the feeling Hef was well and truly stuck in the glory days of Playboy when he had little to no competition and certainly no internet to worry about. 
Along with all this, public perception of the Playboy brand was beginning to shift. It went from being fresh, different, liberating to degrading and exploitative of women, depending on who you spoke to at least. And sales of the magazine in the 90s remained at around the 3 million circulation mark. So I want to touch on a different topic that doesn't particularly fit anywhere else in the timeline. The Playmate to Celebrity Pipeline, we'll call it. We'll basically be discussing the Playmates that went on to have careers in the spotlight after posing for Playboy. I feel pretty confident in saying that one of the magazine's most well-known and successful playmates is Pamela Anderson. She was also very clearly a favorite of Hef's, with more covers under her belt than anyone else, spread over a 20-year time span, which is really impressive. And if you don't know who Pamela Anderson is, she is probably most famous for running on a beach in slow motion in a little red bay bathing suit. Or maybe like me, you grew up watching Home Improvement where she played the tool time girl. And then there is the queen herself, of course, Anna Nicole Smith, who first posed for the cover in 1992 and went on to win Playmate of the Year in 93. Did anyone else watch the Anna Nicole show back in the day, by the way? I remember literally having to go down to Blockbuster or Video Easy or something and hire out the series on DVD because at least to the best of my knowledge, it never aired in Australia, which is like sacrilegious. But anyway, Hollywood sex symbol and blonde bombshell Jane Mansfield also kickstarted her career by posing for Playboy. She was Playmate of the Month in 1955 and made several more appearances in the magazine after this. Sadly, her career was cut short when she tragically died at aged just 34 in a car accident. And lastly, actress Jenny McCarthy was Playmate of the Month in October of 93 and went on to win Playmate of the Year, leading her to a career in show business. I'm sure there is like plenty of other examples of people who began their careers by posing for Playboy, but I just wanted to touch on a few of the more well-known ones for this video. Now let's dive straight into everyone's current favorite time period, the early 2000s. It's a decade that some may argue was somewhat of a resurgence of the Playboy brand, although its spike in popularity was not to last. The early 2000s was also the decade of my youth, so I feel like I can somewhat speak to just how popular the brand was back then. When I tell you that Playboy was was everywhere. It was everywhere. And it was pink. <laughs> Playboy, the brand at least, was suddenly being marketed to teenage girls and the majority of us fell for it hook, line and sinker. Why did I just try to mime that? Why? <laughs> Oh. That pink bunny was slapped on just about everything. Bedspreads, pillows, clothing, jewelry, glassware, seat covers, car seat covers, uh, stuffed toys, bags, video games, you name it. And I'll bet you that bunny head has been slapped on it. I even knew several girls that had the little bunny head tattooed on them, which I'm guessing has probably been covered up or lasered off by now. But if you have a Playboy bunny tattoo, comment down below. I would love to know. In fact, the only thing myself and my friends were not buying that related to Playboy was, well, the magazine. To this day, I don't think I've even physically held a copy of Playboy in my hand. As you may have guessed, Playboy branded merchandise was not only more popular than the magazine, it was earning more money for the company as well. Magazine sales continued to decline through this time period, even around the time of the Girls Next Door airing, which was from 2005 to 2010. In fact, sales halved in this time, from an average circulation of 3 million in 2005 to 1.6 in 
2010, their biggest drop ever in a five year time span. So let's talk about what Hugh Hefner was doing during this early 2000s time period. By this point, Hef had become known as somewhat of a recluse, rarely leaving his Holmby Hills mansion. However, for whatever reason, Hef decided it was time to crawl out from his rock and re-emerge, and he was greeted to a surprisingly very welcoming and warm reception from the public. Hef frequently began to attend parties and nightclubs in LA with a slew of blonde bombshells on each arm of course and somehow the sight of a now much older Hugh Hefner still living his best life as he had decades earlier became a novelty. It was as though Hef had suddenly re-entered popular culture as this 70-something year old guy that wore pajamas like 90% of the time and only dated barely 20 something year old blondes, no less than three at once of course. And this was applauded, celebrated even. It was an attitude of, woo, go Hef, live your best life, you're a legend, an icon. When Hef was coming and going from these clubs, people would literally be cheering, hollering, calling out his name. And this was before the popularity of the girls next door. And I'm not sure if I've touched on this fact, but Hef was known to be fascinated with fame, particularly his own. So I'm sure this sudden rise in his popularity gave him quite a buzz. So with the re-emergence of a pop culture icon and it being the early 2000s, the obvious next step was of course a reality TV show. Classic. <laughs> So if you have never heard of The Girls Next Door, let me give you a brief rundown. The show's original concept was to make a show about Hef, of course, his friends and family and the staff of the Playboy Mansion. Actually, the original, original idea for the show was to make it just about the staff of the mansion, but at this point, Hef was a pretty big draw card, so it probably made more sense to focus on a show about him and his life. When they filmed the pilot, its working title was Hef's World. However, upon watching the pilot footage back, producers got another better idea a show focusing on Hef's three main girlfriends. They reshot the pilot and titled the show The Girls Next Door. I guess the title was meant to be somewhat ironic. The show aired on E! and it broke ratings records and continued to break multiple records over its five year run. The show really became the hit that nobody had been expecting. Least of all its three stars, Holly, Bridget and Kendra. So the premise of the show was basically that cameras followed the everyday lives of the girls and Hef of course, giving viewers a glimpse at what life was like in the mansion and what it was like to be one of Hef's girlfriends. According to Holly, Hef considered all three of these girls in the show really replaceable though considering himself the main draw card but as the show went on it was quite clear that holly bridget and kendra were the stars of the show and hef was merely their co-star each girl on the show had a very distinctive personality and each really was given a character that they were to play up to as well. So Holly was Hef's number one girlfriend and her role was to care the most about Hef and be chasing marriage and babies. Bridget was the sweet and studious girlfriend that was focused on a career in broadcasting and Kendra, the youngest, was the sporty, wild, fun-loving girlfriend. Most episodes of the show are floating around here on YouTube, by the way, so if you're keen for a major 2000s throwback, complete with disposable cameras, low-rise jeans and flip phones, I highly recommend watching it. Some of it is a bit dated, but 
It's a fascinating and strangely addictive watch, nonetheless. The show ran for six seasons, ending in 2010. However, by season six, all three girls had left for various reasons, and the show focused on Hef's three new girlfriends, Crystal Harris, his future third wife, and the Shannon twins, Christina and Carissa. Unsurprisingly, the show was cancelled after this because, as Hef soon learned, it really was Holly, Bridger, and Kendra that made the show what it was. And quite frankly, even I haven't bothered to watch season six, and I loved the first five seasons. The show also played a massive part in the resurgence of the Playboy brand during this period and is probably why the merchandise was so heavily marketed towards teenage girls, especially considering one of Hef's girlfriends was still a teenager herself. I don't think I realized that when I watched the show. And that kind of is disturbing. So hopefully you don't mind if I briefly chat about Holly, Bridget and Kendra each individually for just one moment. I know literally nobody asked for this and if you're not a fan of the show you might not be interested but I am a fan so I absolutely have to take a moment to speak about each of them. So Holly Madison, real name Holly Sue Cullen, moved into the mansion and became Hef's girlfriend in 2001 at the age of 22. In Holly's book, Down the Rabbit Hole, which I highly recommend, she talks about how miserable her first few years at the mansion were. She talks about the bitchiness and cattiness between the multiple girlfriends, as well as Hef's strict rules and bizarre rituals, as the reason for her misery. But Holly remained positive things would get better, and they did. It is worth noting that Holly did believe she was in love with Hef at the time, but has since acknowledged this may have been the result of Stockholm Syndrome. Things began to improve when the girls next door began filming, remembering she'd been at the mansion for four years by this point. And as the show grew in popularity, she and the other girlfriends were given more freedom and flexibility with Hef's stringent rules. One of Hef's rules, for example, was that his girlfriends had to be home at the mansion by 9 p.m. every night, unless they were out with Hef, of course. There's even an episode of The Girls Next Door where they fly to Vegas for a single day for a birthday and still have to hustle to be home by 9 p.m. So as you may have guessed, things weren't all rainbows and butterflies behind the scenes of the show. Holly and Kendra were apparently not the best of friends uh, behind the scenes as they appeared on the show and Holly and Hef's relationship was certainly not the love story it was made to look like on television. In total, Holly and Hef were together for seven years with Holly moving out in 2008 shortly after Bridget and Kendra departed the mansion. She went on to star in her own reality show, Holly's World, and headlined the Vegas burlesque show, Peep Show, for four years before having a baby girl with her husband-to-be, Pasquale, Pascal, pa- ooh, Rotella, in 2013. I- I've heard that name said, but I just cannot pronounce it. Later in 2013, Holly and Pasquale got married at Disneyland, what a dream, <laughs> where Bridget was one of her bridesmaids. The couple went on to have another child together Together, a boy born in 2016 before separating in 2018. She's also released the two books I've mentioned, Down the Rabbit Hole and The Vegas Diaries. Now let's discuss the sweet as a sugar, Bridget Marquardt. I'm sure I've also butchered her last name, but I gave it my best shot. Bridget had actually always dreamed of becoming a playmate. In 1998, she entered the Millennium Playmate search and in 2001 tested twice for the magazine, but was unfortunately unsuccessful. However, her good looks and sweet as pie personality did catch Hef's attention and by 2002, she was living in the mansion as one of Hef's girlfriends. This was of course when Bridget met Holly. The pair immediately hit it off and remain good friends to this day. 
Bridget, who was portrayed as career-focused on the show, already had her bachelor's degree and master's in communications by the time she moved into the mansion and continued studying a graduate-level course in broadcast journalism during her time living with Hef. Before mansion life, Bridget had actually been married. She got married in 1997, aged 23, but separated from her husband to chase her LA dreams. She was the oldest girlfriend, being 29 when she moved in and 35 when she moved out of the mansion in 2008. She left Hef after being offered her own TV show, Bridget's Sexiest Beaches, which, although a cute name, was a short-lived show. She also met her new partner, film director Nick Carpenter, the following year, who she is still with and engaged to today. Also fun fact for anyone that has seen the movie House Bunny, the main character is apparently based off Bridget's personality, so there you go. And last, but most certainly not least, we have Miss Kendra Wilkinson. The ultra-tanned, sporty, bleach blonde was just a teenager when she met Hef and moved into the mansion. Hef spotted Kendra in 2004 when she was hired to be one of the painted ladies at his birthday party. The pair apparently hit it off and it wasn't long before Hef asked Kendra to move into the mansion and be his girlfriend. Kendra was just 19 when she moved moved in. Two years from the legal drinking age in the US, not long after Kendra moved in, Hef whittled down his gaggle of girlfriends to just three. Holly, Bridget and Kendra. During Kendra's last few months at the mansion, she began dating football player Hank Basket, in secret of course. After moving out of the mansion in 2008, Kendra and Hank became engaged and married the following year at the Playboy Mansion, which is an interesting choice. <laughs> In 2009, Kendra announced she was pregnant and soon gave birth to a baby boy, and in 2014, her second child with Hank, a little girl. Like Holly, Kendra has released two books, although I haven't personally read them. And again, like Holly, Kendra, along with her family, starred in their own reality TV show, uniquely titled Kendra. It ran for two years and four seasons. She then starred in another reality show called Kendra on Top, which actually lasted six seasons and five years. I haven't personally watched any of Kendra's shows and I've only watched a few episodes of Holly's World because that's literally all I can find online, but I am impressed that Kendra actually remained consistently on reality TV between 2005 and 2017. Like she actually grew up on TV, which is pretty wild. In 2018, Kendra and Hank filed for divorce after nine years of marriage. Whew, anyway, that was a quick rundown of each girl. If you did watch the show, tell me who your favorite girl is. Mine was Kendra when I watched the show as a teenager, probably because she was a teenager, I was a teenager, I connected to her. But now my favorite is definitely Holly, who has a YouTube channel, by the way, and I'm kind of obsessed with it. <laughs> so we cannot talk about the girls next door without closing out with its final chapter of the show Crystal Harris. As I said she starred in season six with the Shannon twins but at the time it began filming there was a slight crossover with Holly, Bridger and Kendra leaving the mansion and the new girls moving in. Not to mention the original three were contractually obligated to do season six. Again haven't watched the last season but I believe the three girls were briefly in the show just to kind of wrap things up neatly and put a little bow on top. After all, the world couldn't be thinking that the playboy himself, Hugh Hefner, had been dumped by not one but three girls all at once. It had to look nice and amicable. The original three were shown moving on with their lives and careers as three fresh and eager new girls were ready and waiting to take their place. Crystal took the place of the number one girlfriend, 
The fact there's even a number one girlfriend is kind of gross, but I digress. The show continued filming as it always had, but there is no denying the show was kind of rubbish without the original three. As I said before, season six was the last season of the iconic show. In 2010, the Shannon twins moved out, leaving Crystal as not only girlfriend number one, but the only girlfriend very unusual for Hugh Hefner. She would also be Hef's last girlfriend. Later in 2010 on Christmas Eve, the couple got engaged and planned to marry the following year. However, just five days before the wedding, Crystal bailed and cancelled the entire wedding, which was kind of awkward because the next issue of Playboy due out just days after the wedding had Crystal on the cover with the words, America's Princess, introducing Mrs. Crystal Hefner. I don't really get the America's Princess part either. She certainly wasn't that popular or that well liked, let alone America's Princess. To save face, a big red sticker was slapped on the cover of Playboy as it went to print that said, Runaway Bride in this issue. Big yikes. On Twitter, Hef simply said regarding his runaway bride, Crystal has had a change of heart. The pair soon reconciled, however, and married in an intimate ceremony the following December. That day, he tweeted out, it's good to be in love. At the time, Crystal Harris was 26 and Hugh Hefner was 86. Also during this time period, sales of Playboy magazine hit the under 1 million circulation mark for the first time since the magazine's conception in the 50s. In 2016, Hugh Hefner sold his famous Playboy Mansion for $100 million, although 100 times more than he, or at least Playboy Enterprises, paid for it, it was actually half of what the asking price had been, which was $200 million. The sale came with an interesting condition though. Hef was allowed to continue living at the now rundown mansion until he passed away. The man that purchased the mansion was businessman Darren Metropolis, who had also purchased the mini version of the Playboy Mansion next door years earlier, where Hef's ex-wife once lived. A uh, fun fact, Darren Metropolis is the co-owner of the Hostess brand, those little cakes with these strange names that you guys have in the US. So yeah, who knew that very subpar tasting cakes could be such a lucrative business? I feel like I've probably offended someone in America by calling those cakes subpar, but I stand by those names being strange. Twinkies, Ding Dongs and Ho Ho's. Y'all are wild over there. Darren Metropolis said at the time of the purchase that he planned to restore the mansion to its former gothic glory. And he also signed an agreement with the city of Los Angeles that ensured the mansion would be permanently protected from demolition, no matter who owned it, which I found pretty interesting. Today, no one actually lives at the mansion, but it seems to be slowly being restored. Although looters have unfortunately been breaking in since Hef's passing back in 2017 and stealing bits and pieces from Hef's own possessions to bits of the mansion wall as a keepsake. In 2017, Hugh Hefner passed away in his mansion at aged 91. At the time of his passing, he was still married to Crystal. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, he was laid to rest in the crypt next to Marilyn Monroe. After his passing, sales of Playboy continued to plummet with circulation at a mere 200,000 in 2018. 
Oh, and here we are, the final chapter in the Playboy story. It has been a journey, hasn't it? Last year marked the end of an era for the magazine. After an impressive 66 years in production, Playboy announced that the magazine would no longer be sold in print. The magazine is now only available in digital form and released every three months. And although I never purchased a hard copy myself, I was somewhat saddened to hear this, which I know sounds strange, but I see this move as the beginning of the end for the magazine, which I think is somewhat sad. Surprisingly, the news was announced without much fuss or fanfare, although it was 2020, so I guess more important things were happening. So what led Playboy to this decision? Of course, as I did mention, sales had been declining for years. But in 2016, Playboy made a pretty controversial decision that likely hurt the magazine significantly. They decided to remove nudity from its pages. A decision I nor anyone else really understood. Uh, Removing nudity from Playboy is like removing peanut butter from a Reese's Pieces. Uh, Peanut butter is what makes those little cups so damn good. Remove the peanut butter and you're left with a chocolate shell of nothingness. Weird analogy, but you get my point. Playboy's explanation for their decision was because the internet had made nudity in magazines outdated and obsolete. I mean, they're not wrong, but again, removing nudity, the essence of Playboy, isn't going to change that fact. Does anyone remember that episode of Friends where Joey and Chandler are fighting over this chair and Joey finally decides to give Chandler the chair, but he takes the cushions. And Chandler says, but the cushions are the essence of the chair. And Joey's like, that's right, I'm taking the essence. What are you doing? We said I had to give you the chair. You didn't see anything about the cushions. (laughs) The cushions are the essence of the chair. That's right. I'm taking the essence. That was like the worst acting ever. My apologies. But anyway, what Playboy did was remove the essence of their magazine. Uh, Of course, Playboy soon realized their mistake after publishing nine nudity-free issues. And when they brought back the nudity, they even created this super cool hashtag, Naked is Normal, to mark the occasion. Thanks, Playboy. Revolutionary. The following year, the chief creative director of Playboy, also Hef's son, publicly admitted to the decision being a mistake. Yeah, no joke. (laughs) The decision reversal didn't do much for magazine sales, though. And I still do wonder if the whole idea was a stunt. But who knows, honestly? Another problem Playboy was having around this time and had been for a while was understanding their target audience. And quite frankly, as a brand, if you don't understand who your audience is, (laughs) you're in a world of trouble. They seem to be trying to appeal to millennials, but by doing so, they isolated some of their long-term readers, the Gen Xs and baby boomers. So what does the future hold for Playboy? There is, in my opinion, no real way to revive the brand at this point. It truly is a product of its time. And unfortunately, like when video killed the radio star, I think the internet well and truly has killed Playboy magazine. The Playboy brand is still selling merchandise, but I think the magazine is likely to stop publishing long before the brand itself dies out. But I guess time will tell. If and when the magazine does eventually announce that it will cease production, I feel like it's going to be pretty anticlimactic. They'll probably just go out quietly like they did when they transitioned the magazine to online. Sure, the news will likely make some headlines. People will reminisce about the magazine, discuss how much they loved it, despite the fact that most of my generation at least have likely never even purchased a physical copy of Playboy in their lives. And although the magazine is just about dead, I get the feeling the brand has a good few years left in it. And that infamous little bunny head logo 
isn't disappearing anytime soon, especially if you got it tattooed onto yourself circa 2008. And that, my friends, was the rise and fall of Playboy. Thank you so much if you made it this far in this very different for me part two series. Let me know your thoughts down below or any other videos you would like me to do. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did making it. And until next time, I'll see you. I don't have an outro now. It's not true crime. Let's just say I'll see you soon. <laughs>